Good morning. Okay. Today is the 23rd of August, 2018. Time is really flying. This is the Nibbles IO daily programming stream. My name is Jeff. I write code every day and I stream it here on Twitch Monday through Friday. I'm working on a project called Base Code, which is a programming language that I'm designing. And um, I just, uh, OBS. <laughs> this is the tip jar. It moved. I, you know, this thing, man. I'll tell you. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they botched the UI really badly. <clears throat> Arun is, um, I think Go popularized that term, although I could be wrong. Um, <clears throat> it's just a Unicode code point. Okay, so I was able to... <laughs> to I really think I need to downgrade. Of course, if I downgrade, it probably doesn't... Um, So I locked it, but now I can't unlock it. <clears throat> oh, there we go. All right. No. <sighs> well, no tip jar. I'm just going to hide it. <clears throat> Unbelievable. And the funny thing is, if I, after the stream, and I close OBS, reopen it, it'll be somewhere else. <sighs> da -da 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 -da. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, Rune is... Um, I'm not sure who first, I want to say Go pop, popularized the usage of the name um, as, a, as a name for a complex character. Instead of saying code point, you know, um, they called it a rune. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, but it's just a Unicode, it's just an integer. Um, So UTF-8, which is what the compiler supports, 
and, and what I think I probably will support by default in the end is um, it's a Biden coating, right? So if certain conditions are met, right? So <clears throat> ASCII, not extended ASCII, original ASCII was zero to 127. Um, hey, uh, Wiesen 3000. Um, so UTF-8 says, okay, well, if it's, if it's outside of that range, then it might be a two byte character. And then if the second byte is outside of a certain range, then it might be a three byte character and so on and so forth, all the way up to four bytes. So, um, and you're not actually losing anything um, with UTF-8, which is why out of all the UTF encodings, it's the best um, because it's, you pay a processing price, I guess, but if the code point takes a full 32-bit integer to express, then you're only using the four bytes. If it only takes, you know, 16 bits to express, then you're only using two bytes. So it's a, it's a much more adaptive encoding for UTF versus something like, you know, say the .NET framework, which decided to make everything like, I think that they chose UTF-32 actually. So characters are extremely expensive in the .NET framework. Um, <clears throat> I don't know internally, they might optimize around that a little bit. But. Anywho, hey Kubasis, how am I? Um, I'm okay, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> It's only tricky insofar as you have to anticipate that in your design, right? So like if you if you look at um, source file, um, so source file is a wrapper, right? Around a buffer that has UTF-8 stuff in it. Um, so if we look at next, we return back a rune, um, and <clears throat> this is using, I have the UTF-8 decoding instructions. And so these functions are designed around the idea that I have to know how many bytes um, I just dealt with. So as long as you anticipate that ahead of time, and then you incorporate that, so, you know, inside of source file, we just have a byte buffer. We don't really, we're interpreting it as UTF-8, but it's just a bunch of bytes. Um, and, but the helper functions that I, I have <clears throat> um, tell me how many bytes were consumed or were considered as part of the UTF-8 decoding. And I can then use that to move correctly through the, the stream. So, yeah, as long as you take that into consideration, it's not... Now, obviously, I put an abstraction on top of it. You wouldn't want all the code everywhere to have to deal with those realities, right? So you have to, you have to wrap it to make it reasonable. Um, now, obviously, one thing you could do is you could make a generic you know, string-like abstraction. Oh, sea lion's ready to break itself. Didn't I already apply this? Well, I guess this is just a slightly newer build. Um, <clears throat> so we'll see if it destroys itself. Uh, what was I saying? <clears throat> yeah, so you could go ultra generic, right? And you could have your string class, whatever type, handle that complexity at that level. So obviously something like the .NET framework and go do that for you um, at, the, at, at their string abstraction. 
maybe you don't want that. You know, it, it just depends, right? So, like when I get when we get into strings with um, <clears throat> the compiler here, I think I prefer the C plus plus interpretation of string, um, which is really kind of the assembler CPU interpretation of string, which is a bag of bytes. <clears throat> it's not. You could interpret it as UTF-8, UTF-32, whatever, um, but that's up to kind of the consuming application. So at the lowest level, strings would just be buffers, which have some convenience things that allow them, you know, we, we make some simplistic upfront assumptions that they're things that do string-like things, but um, like in C++. I mean, you can use a standard string, it's just, you can just put stuff in it. It doesn't really matter. The abstraction doesn't prevent that, which I think is, again, at that lowest level, <clears throat> I think that's the, the right abstraction. And then you could build a UTF-8 string on top of it, so on and so forth. Excuse me. Okay, so yesterday after the stream, I did a bunch of stuff that wasn't related to the compiler, um, which allowed one of the very tiny hamster cages in my brain to run in the background and um, think about a couple of issues I had run into. Um, so yesterday, for those who were watching, I implemented the constant assignment operator. Um, this this works. Got that uh, doing what it should be doing. I further fixed the underlying issues for creating what I'm terming type aliases here. So IDT becomes an alias to a U8. So that means I can do this, and it means I can do this, and this works. Now, <clears throat> the devil's always in the details. Um, it works kind of like the C compiler does it, <clears throat> which is not really exactly what I want. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is anywhere IDT is found, it becomes a U8, right? Because this is just an alias right now. And so none of the error reporting, none of the things that refer to this type after it's been defined are not, they don't see IDT, IDT under, or ID underscore T here, they see U8. So, but that's confusing in my mind. I mean, if you create a new name for something, it should be referred to by that name. Um, <clears throat> so I went down this huge rabbit hole last night after I thought about this a lot and did a huge refactoring around and for type and um, realized it wasn't gonna solve the problem um, the way I wanted to solve it. So I <clears throat> put that code in a different branch. Um, I didn't want to lose it, but I don't think I'm going to use it. Didn't intend for that to rhyme. And um, yeah, now I'm thinking about a different way to fix the issue. Um, Journey started says, to graphically show the relationships of your classes to use an online app, is it a feature of GitHub, which I'm not familiar with? When you say graphically show the re relationships of your classes, um, I don't think I've ever diagrammed any of the C++ code. Are you, are you talking about the, the diagrams that the compiler generates for the AST and the code DOM? If that's what you're talking about, that's... Um, yeah. 
if that's what you are talking about. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the compiler outputs text files that are in the dot format. You can Google that. It's part of GraphViz. Um, <clears throat> it's a very simple format. This is what it looks like. The compiler doesn't try to make it look pretty. It just spews this out. Okay, so what's what's the dot format? What's you know? So GraphViz is designed to visualize graphs. Graphs are nodes and edges. <clears throat> the dot textual format is a way of enumerating your nodes and then enumerating the edges t between those nodes. And then GraphViz takes care of visualizing it, right? So I don't draw any, I don't have any code that draws anything. It just, I spew out this file and <clears throat> then you run it through um, the dot command. And there's, there's actually several of these. There's dot, there's cute, there, there's a couple of them, right? Um, I'm sorry, dot, neato, two pi, circo. <clears throat> so if you install GraphViz and you do a man on dot, it will tell you all about how these tools work. And <clears throat> each one of these that consumes the same file format, but the way in which it renders the output is different, right? They all have a slightly different um, output format. Or, they also have a slightly different layout algorithm. Right. So if I run dot on this and I do type PDF and then it's short DOM dot and then the output is short DOM PDF and then I open short DOM PDF. This is what it produces, right? Now this is what the dot tool produces. If I run that same thing through Neato, which again is part of GraphViz, this is just a different visualization. Yeah, looks like shit, but you get the idea, right? They have a bunch of different renderers and <clears throat> you pick the one that works the best for what you're trying to do and this one, you know, dot works the best, generally speaking, for what I'm using it for. This is, these are not classes. This data, that, or what you're seeing here is the compiler element model, the code DOM. This is what it looks like. So this is the model that the compiler generates in memory as it's running. And this is a visualization of that. <clears throat> it's a helpful tool when I'm doing small things um, like this, like this short file, this works okay. Where this starts to break down is, you know, when things get too much bigger than this, like maybe say a thousand lines of, of code, it's too much. Um, so it's a helpful debugging tool in the small, um, and I probably will always maintain um, the, the feature to generate the files if you want them. Because again, it, it can be handy to see, <clears throat> what, especially if you're doing metaprogramming, I think, um, you know, to be able to see what the model is that you're trying to manipulate uh, can be helpful. And there are, two, there are two models that get generated here. Um, one is the <clears throat> code DOM, which we just looked at. The other is the, um, the AST. And there's an AST per module compiled, right? So <clears throat> there's many of these and there's only one code DOM because the way the base code compiler works, everything comes into one compilation unit, essentially. So this is what the AST looks like. <clears throat> you can see this one renders slightly differently. Part of that was just because 
<clears throat> I wanted to be able to visually tell what I was looking at quickly. But the other part is, I think the AST, the AST is a simpler structure. <clears throat> it doesn't have all these cross-connecting relationships like the code DOM does. Um, so this top-down rendering uh, looked better, works better. So anyway, that's what that is. <clears throat> um, yeah, so far C lane seems to be okay. I'll keep my fingers uh, crossed. Yeah, I love, I secretly love RUP. I love UML. I love to draw diagrams that represent absolutely nothing. It's my, <laughs> it's my little secret sin that I practice daily. <clears throat> Does this represent the actual run pipeline? Um, no, it, it represents the end state. Right, so whatever state the model is in, when the compiler is done, that's what gets put out. Now, <clears throat> once we start getting into metaprogramming, you know, it might make sense, maybe, I don't know, to have a feature, like so we could expose like an intrinsic, right, to a base code program so that if you call this intrinsic function, it will create a snapshot of the code DOM into one of those dot files. And then you could create many snapshots and then you could look at them, right? So you could look at what it was before you start doing metaprogramming against it. And at certain points, I could see that being a useful feature. Um, so, you know, something like that probably is in the offing once we get into, uh, once we get into the metaprogramming. <clears throat> Thanks a lot to take in. Yeah, the one thing I would say, um, again, and <clears throat> when, you're, when you're trying to solve problems like that, just remember that in the Unix world, there's always some program that takes some text file and turns it into something else. <laughs> which may be another text file, or it may be something pretty like a PDF, which technically is a text file. Um, so yeah, just always keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, everything in a, on a computer is input, process, output, input, transform, output, right? No magic. And Anything like that that you would want to do, if you wanted to generate a sequence diagram, if you wanted to generate UML, if you wanted to generate whatever, there is some tool that takes some textual format that turns it into that thing, right? It's just figuring out what those tools are, figuring out what that format is, and then writing the code to produce the text so that you can get what you want. C line can get a big hog. I definitely set the Java heap to be 24 gigs. I actually, my Java heap is only two gigs. It's not very large. And I very rarely, um, it's like every now and again, it'll go through a massive garbage collection cycle and it'll be annoying, but it's pretty rare. Um, I almost never have to restart. So again, like, I don't know if you're running on Windows, you know, I almost never have to restart C-Lion or any IntelliJ um, stuff. I, it just works. Uh, even, even when their parser was broken, I mean, that stuff, I never really had issues with that stuff too much. Yeah. I, so again, if you're having lots of issues, that could be an environment thing. Maybe there's something different about your development environment. Um,
Okay, so what was I saying yesterday? So yesterday I was going through this big refactoring um, and yeah, I tried to change an infer type and now retroactively looking back on it, it was a bad idea. Although it did, I guess, kind of give me additional breadcrumbs, I think, on the path to what I would like to do. So, so again, here's the, I don't close the file. <clears throat> here's the, the issue. Um, this ID underscore key is now a type alias to a unsigned byte. And then you can use that. That all works. That does what it's supposed to do. But at this site where I reference this, um, what this really needs to be either, so I already have an identifier reference in the model. Um, so either I continue to keep it as, because right now what's happening is I'm I'm seeing this, I'm saying, oh, okay, that's an identifier. Does that identifier point to a type? If it does, then what I'm doing is I'm just swapping the type in, in its place, which again, works, but um, the, the downside is we lose the um, context. Um, so I could either leave it an identifier reference, add some stuff to identifier reference so that it, like identifier reference knows it's a type alias maybe, um, I don't know. Or I introduce a type reference, which would be similar to an identifier reference, but then I don't like that so much because it's like the same thing, uh, almost literally the same thing. So. Needless to say, I'm taking that problem and I'm letting the, you know, two core hamster processor work on that. Um, and <laughs> the, I can hear the wheel squeaking a little bit uh, in my head. But I'm going to, I'm going to probably end up settling somewhere between, um, enhancing identifier reference slightly or maybe going all the way to, you know, introducing a type reference. Um, and then obviously a type reference would have the original name and the actual, a pointer to the actual type that it is. <clears throat> and so then we maintain um, constant uh, or consistent contextual consistency. <clears throat> Yeah, we talked about this yesterday. Colon, colon, equal is a constant assignment. So this creates a type alias. So the equivalent in, yes. So the equivalent in C or C++, right, would be, well, in C it would be type def, you know, sort of a deal or using. Um, so this is how you do type aliasing, very simple. <clears throat> And you can only do type aliasing with a with a constant assignment. You can't do this with a non-constant assignment. If you try, the compiler will tell you you're a bad person. See, so you can't do it with a non-constant assignment. <clears throat> well, okay, so technically what this is is ID underscore T is a variable. It's an identifier in this scope that points to this type. It is that type. So then anywhere where you use that identifier slash variable, whatever you want to call it, although this has no storage, right? There's no memory at runtime associated with this. This is just internal to the compiler. Um, this is the equivalent of a U8. This is the equivalent of a U8. Um, well, stated, I guess, yes, technically, yeah.
because that's the way, like if you create a struct, my fancy type, right? The, this is just an identifier, a variable like any other. This just happens to be a variable that points at a type. So, but you can use this then <clears throat> as a, a substitute for the type. Because internally the compiler generates an identifier for the type. Um, I guess technically you could, you could use that too, but you may not know what it is. Now with type of and, and type info, once we get some of those things generating, then we will have mechanisms to get at that information. But right now I know it's not plumbed in. <clears throat> so, yeah. So anyway, I'm gonna think about that one a little bit more. I think the, um, I think the solution actually will end up being fairly straightforward. I just need to see it in my head first. So that brings me to the second thing. <clears throat> Yes. Yes. To answer Voight Comp Phil's question, they they are floats. That's what they are at that point. <laughs> like here. We should even be able to do early single test case, right? So you said speed T is an F32 and, oh no, I don't make it an F32, and you said distance T is an F32. Okay, so we just created two type aliases. Now we want to say um, delta is equal to, um, I always do it this way. Let's say S is the speed T and he's equal to 1.25 and D is a distance T and he's equal to 5.12. So then delta is S times D. So it sees these as the correct size. These are 32-bit values. And where's delta? Delta, delta. Where did you go? Oh, you're probably down in data, aren't you? There he is. Yep, so he's a 32-bit value. And so then if we come down here toward the end of the file, Ah, okay, well, yeah, that's not good. Why? Oh, yeah, okay, so that could highlight a bug in the code generation. Um, although I'm curious why, because it recognizes it as a float. Oh, no, I know what the issue is here. This is actually... Yeah, okay. This is because this should be recognized as a constant expression and it's not. So that's probably another small bug, right? It's not seeing these as constant, um, constant and assignable. Cause yeah, it should be. All right.
Because one is an alias and one isn't. Right. So, and I mean, technically, if you want, you can use the same syntax for both. So actually, I want to make a note to myself here real quick. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll explain here in a sec. Uh, what the hell do I want to say this? Assignment. This is just a small bug here. Okay, so let me see if I can explain this. So the constant assignment, right? That just means that once speed T has been assigned, whatever's on the right-hand side, it can't be changed, okay? The single colon equal means that the variable on the left is mutable. Um, just means now, this is assuming you're creating it all in one, okay? So if you pre-declare it and then, then choose an assignment, you know, that a slightly different syntax. Now, the reason I'm using the constant assignment for type aliases um, <clears throat> is just because my thought is you would typically, well, hey, you don't want to really change that right on the fly um you you want that to be that thing right um <clears throat> correct single colon equal is it could do initialization right um but yeah so here let me let's do this uh let's create another sample file here. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say you do um, foo and you assign it to eight. Okay, so what is this doing? In this scenario, this is defining a variable foo in the current scope. It's initializing it to the value of eight. And because eight is a constant, because the right-hand side is constant, what will happen in this case is this will actually go into uh, one of the <clears throat> segments, <clears throat> uh, constant segments for initialization, um, because this is a global variable, right? In, in this language, at this level, it's a global variable. Um, now, the type here is being inferred. So an, the value eight fits into a U8. So you're gonna get a U8 here. That's what the type of this will be. Now you could write this a different way. You could say, I know it's going to be a U8 or I want it to be a U8, regardless of what the compiler might say. Then I'm going to assign a value to it, okay? This is slightly different. Here is the declaration. This is allocating storage for that global variable, or if this were in a stack, you know, frame beyond the stack, um, this is then assigning that. Now, the difference between, so I'm gonna do bar up here. The difference between this and this in the global context is that this is going into, there's no code that's generated for this. This is a, the only thing that happens here is the storage is allocated in the correct section and the initial value of that variable in that section is eight. Assuming again, that the right-hand side is constant. If the right-hand side is not constant, then it's the same as this, right? But um, if it's constant, then there's no code emitted for this case. This, there's always code emitted here, right? Now, technically, I could get 
I could make the compiler super intelligent and I could say, okay, here's where the declaration is. Okay, has anybody mutated foo yet? Oh, okay, here's the first mutation. Okay, I, that's a constant. I can fold that. I could theoretically make this the same as that in some limited cases, but right now I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, okay, here's the declaration. Then later I have an assignment here. Um, the compiler says, oh, foo already exists. I need to actually emit some code to change its value in memory, okay? Um, and here, you know, this is a mutable, uh, this is mutable, right? So this is like a variable in C or C++ that's not const. I can change it however much I want. Um, and I can do the same th thing to bar, right? I can change bar all I want, okay? So now let's say you want to make a constant like pi. And, you know, what's the definition of a constant? Well, it's just something that you can read from, right? You can reference it, but you can't change it. So this is an example, just like this, of initializing a variable called pi in this current global scope, module scope is what it's called. And once pi, is initialized to this value, that's it. It can't, you can't change pi here. It's not possible. You can't reassign it. You can't, it just doesn't work, okay? So that's constant. Now, there, there are things in the language like type declarations. So let's, let's you know, do an IDT um, is a U32, okay? So I would, when I would make a type alias, I would think that that's a constant thing, right? I don't, and I'm not talking about metaprogramming here. I'm talking about runtime behavior. Um, meta, obviously with metaprogramming, I could go in and I could find that assignment and change it to anything I want, but <clears throat> that's a different use case. At runtime, I would expect this type to be stable would expect it to be this. So to your point about structs, why are they different? It's a good point. There really isn't any valid reason for it. So technically a vector three would be this, right? Um, and because this is the type of the struct and hey, you don't want it to change. The only thing I did this before I did structs and stuff before I did this. So I just need to add a rule to the <clears throat> compiler that basically says, hey, if the right-hand side is defining a type, so if it's a struct, an enum, a union, a procedure, whatever, then it's a constant assignment. Although procedures are kind of funny because you probably do want to be able to, you want those to be fungible. Um, so, but yeah, that's, this is for, for user-defined types like structs, enums, unions, whatever, this is probably the correct syntax. So, and I think the, the compiler would be just totally fine doing this. Um, so let's just say X is F32. I just don't have a rule in there that prevents the other uh, scenario. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. 
Yeah, see, the, the code emit doesn't understand the type aliasing, so I gotta fix that. But, <clears throat> anyway, that works. And then if I try to reassign, right, vector three, that's an error. Although, oh, I know why it's doing that. That's because of the, that's because of the struct. I'm not collecting the location information correctly, it looks like. Maybe. They did mess up their finding files thing. It like refreshes incorrectly. So I'm using the location on the target. Why is that not correct in that case? Target symbol. Line 17, column 0, line 17, column 7. Okay. That seems all right. Uh, yeah, no, that actually seems okay. Oh. <laughs> I wonder if I just hit an issue. it does. I think I know why it's doing what it's doing. Always bugs. Yep. All right. So that's a bug. Let's create an issue for that. Source file. What did I call it? No, no. Source file error. Source file error does not format properly if on the last line. And there we go. All right, so that's bug, but that's, yeah, it's easy. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> okay, so H-A-C-S-T, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. <clears throat> I think I answered, um, no, it was not an instance. It is a type definition, but I think I just explained why one was done before the other. So I'm going to touch up that. In fact, before I forget, Um, you, uh, I would say that it's like the left-hand side, you're saying the left-hand side is constant, is what it is. 
the right hand side that you're assigning to it may or may not be constant. Um, but what the constant assignment operator, the colon colon equals says is that after the assignment is complete, the left hand side, whatever symbol that is, is um, it's constant, right? That cannot be changed after that assignment. Um, so we could we use colon equals scalar types two a as well six. If I remember my Unix file handling, all these things are reference alias file. Um, yeah, I mean, it already kind of works that way. It's just that in this particular case, I don't, um, <clears throat> I don't have an intermediary representation for a type reference. Again, I sort of do, I, I might have to, I'm probably gonna have to refactor some stuff, but essentially what you're describing is the way it works. Um, how easy will it be to create C bindings in this language? Well, I have one example right here. Uh, so Lordborn, here's an example of creating a binding to something in C. <clears throat> Any progress on mystery? I was excited to read what you've got in Russ. Uh, no, I haven't abandoned it. Um, you know, what, one of my shortcomings is that I get like really into what I'm doing. And then I like sometimes, even though I try not to, I sometimes end up in the um, recursive fractal uh, trap. And with mystery, where I had gotten to was essentially starting to define a, a complex parser for the interface to the game. And I, I, I sort of, um, I don't know, I sort of got really obsessed with that and, and then went off on a massive tangent on trying to make it like really, really cool. And, um, and then the problem with that is I came up with tons of really great ideas, but then it's, okay, how do I chunk this into 30 minute videos? And I have a bunch of notes about what I want to do, and I just I just haven't done it. So, and then the the Ru or not Rusty Kong, but the Sea Kong thing, which is going to be called King Koala. You know, I have the artwork. The artist is finishing up some stuff for me on that. I have to swap in the new artwork because I don't. Nintendo just like went lawsuit happy, and just sued a shit ton of people, and I don't want to be on that list. I already have enough legal problems. So <clears throat> I want to swap out all that artwork and change the name before I start making videos again. Um, and, you know, I hope, I hope that uh, Nintendo doesn't come around because the first set of videos that are out there are with the original name and the original content. Um, I'm going to change it. So hopefully their lawyers are like, oh, okay. He's already changed it, but we'll see. Um, many times when you are answering chat with example code, you find, yeah, of course. Um, yes. Edis do says much like a JS const object. Yeah, yeah. You know, like in, in JavaScript, I think you can do let, right? And so there's var and there's let I think let is, if I'm remembering correctly, is the equivalent of like the constant uh, stuff I'm doing, um, as where var would be something that. Uh, It's really neat how concise statically typed languages can be with some base. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I, I did. I captured a couple good bugs out of that. I don't know if Lord Warren saw the uh, foreign declaration, but I mean, actually defining you know foreign. Um, 
function stuff is fairly straightforward. Uh, I don't think there will be too many challenges with that. Um, well, Nintendo hasn't said anything to me. I'm, I'm trying to be proactive to prevent them from saying anything to me. Um, but so, yeah, a lot of those projects are they're not gone. They're just, you know, mystery. I have to get a plan in place for how I'm going to go forward with it. And I think I'm probably just going to end up having to do something really simple on the parser side and then we'll evolve it into a more advanced cool thing but um, okay so then the other thing that I kind of started yesterday and I thought a lot about throughout the day yesterday was were compiler intrinsics <clears throat> um, I have uh, We have two different kinds of intrinsics so far. And I think I have a plan for how to do this better than what I was originally thinking. Um, so one type of intrinsic is something that the compiler actually would generate code for. So an example of that would be alloc and free. Those are compiler intrinsics that generate real bytecode, which ironically, they generate the alloc and the free instruction. Now, the because of the way the compiler works, there's everything's going through registers, so there's going to be some prologue and epilogue code around those. But generally speaking, right, in that those two cases, that's an example of a compi the compiler is going to generate code in that scenario. Um, the other type of intrinsic is, I guess, what I would call a constant folded intrinsic. So like a line of, size of, type of, these are, um, these don't generate code per se. They just get swapped out with whatever their value is. So as an example, you're going to say, what is the alignment of food, right? So a line of foo, okay, this doesn't generate code per se that runs at runtime. This becomes one, right? If I had a, a Bing that was a U16 and I said a line of Bing, this would just collapse to two. So this class of intrinsic it's not code generative. They just fold to whatever constant value the compiler says they ought to be. Um, and all three of these, actually, the align of, size of, and type of, they all focus around the type, right? The align of is on the type. The size of is on the type. Type is the type. Um, now, these two would be pretty easy to implement right now. Type of, I have some other things things that I'm going to need to emit to make that correct. And then alloc and free should be fairly straightforward. It's just that these then, these aren't fold or, you know, constant compile time things. These are emit time things, um, which again, should not be problematic, but So what I had started doing there, kind of in anticipation of what I would need to build for that, I added an intrinsic element. And the intrinsic element behaves more or less on the surface, like a procedure call. But it is, it is not a regular procedure call. Then I got to thinking about, okay, so I think alloc free, a line of size of typo, 
these are all subclasses of intrinsic. And then the specific folding behavior or code emit behavior for those intrinsics can go in those subclasses. Hey, Raul Rita. <clears throat> So I think that's how that's going to work. And that will be scalable, flexible enough that as new intrinsics come into play, um, no, there is no documentation. Um, should I call it? No documentation, or why no? Ah, I gotta look it up. Hold on. I have a command covering this. <laughs> ah. Close. Why no docs? That's why. And also, I have another one. That's why. <laughs> mm. So, what was I saying? Um, well, I just realized I can do If and when you feel like teaching something, let me know. Go ahead. Shoot. I'm kind of in uh, review mode, plan mode anyway. Struck size of padding alignment. Okay. <clears throat> Is there something specific about that topic or just generally speaking? Okay, so first let's let's talk about padding slash alignment. Okay, um, depending on the CPU, right, that you're running on, um, there can be two <coughs> reasons why you would pad or align data. One of them is that the CPU simply will halt if certain kinds of data are not aligned properly. Um, so historically, the example I always come back to is the original Motorola 68000. It was an alignment bitch. It would literally just, it would just die, right? If you did not align things properly. Um, so that's one reason. 
Another reason why a compiler, or you might manually pad or align something, is because there's a performance benefit for it. So as an example, like most Intel CPUs are more forgiving about alignment. However, in doing so, they lose performance, right? They, they go into a degraded execution path for instructions to deal. They do the aligning, the aligning for you essentially at runtime, but there's a cost for that. <clears throat> now, even Intel, there are some parts of the architecture that are just fixed alignment and there's nothing you can do about that. But again, I'm making a general observation that like Intel's been more friendly to misalignment than other architectures. Um, but going back to my original example of the 68000, subsequent versions of that processor also relax a lot of their alignment issues. So the, like I think starting with the 68020, the CPU would not just halt <laughs> if you got the alignment wrong. It would also go into a, it would correct for the alignment problem at the cost, at the you know, price of more cycles um, for executing instructions. So that's the, re those are really the reasons why um, you would want to align something because ultimately either the CPU requires it or, or possibly some other device on the bus requires it. So as an example, um, like on the Raspberry Pi 3, uh, and I think this is true of Raspberry Pi 2 as well, the GPU, right, it needs to access things essentially on 256-bit boundaries. Um, and if it's not on that alignment, the machine will halt. Um, and now padding is typically how you would get to an alignment. Um, however, I want to clarify that there is padding that you would add specifically for alignment purposes, and then there's padding you would add as a programmer because you want to reserve space. <clears throat> so oftentimes you will see structures in C or C++ or other languages where you'll see reserved for future use or now, sometimes they do that because it conveniently pads to an alignment, but sometimes they put that in there because they legitimately thought that they might want to come back and put something there. So padding can have two meanings depending on what exactly it is you're doing. Now, you're talking about C, so I'm assuming you're not talking about padding that the developer would put in to a struct. Um, for their own purposes, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you mean padding that the compiler would generate, which ultimately just comes down to moving addresses where things are defined, right? Um, but that's the only distinction I would make on padding. Now, um, I don't think... I don't think the C or C++ standard have Excuse me. Yeah, so the standard does talk about like where alignment would go, where padding would go. Um, however, I don't think there's a standard way in the language to detect padding or alignment. Typically those are compiler specific pragmas or intrinsics that you have to use to deduce that if you need to know it. Mm. My struct is type def struct, void, pointer, next, u16, u16. Okay. Mm. 
Right. Yeah. That. Yep. say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason there's no, you just happen to have a combination of sizes that they align, right? Um, so it's nothing special has to happen here. But if I malloc the structure, it only works if I manually place 72. Um, yeah, I'd have to see the code. I'm not sure. Um, you said you're using Visual C++ too, right? Yeah, that, that doesn't make sense. I mean, that's three of them. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's happening there. I mean, so here's something I would suggest, uh, Raul Rita. Um, I don't remember the exact command line flag, but I'm sure you can Google it. Um, Visual Studio will produce an assembly file for you uh, when it compiles it. Have it generate, you know, an assembly file and look at what it's doing, right? Look at what the structure looks like. Um, because again, this is why I tell people <laughs> At some point, you're gonna to need to know assembly, at least on some level, because look, the compilers are good and you know they do their job, but sometimes you have to understand what, what they're doing. And the only way to do that is look at what they're generating. So yeah, take a look and see, you know. Especially if you can just create a small sample program that defines the struct, like in a main, you know, create one of them. And, and I would even just, I'd do two things, right? Like I'd, I'd create one on the stack and then I'd also malloc one and then, you know, see what, and then try to access the fields from, in both cases, see what the compiler's generating to try to understand why things might be <clears throat> different than you, uh, that different than you expect. Yes, brain distraction. That's because I have a bunch of, you know, hamster cages spinning in the background and uh, in my meat computer. And so I need to think about other things. <laughs> so what I wanted to kind of walk through, um, uh, Hexed, I guess that's how you say that. I guess I see why you don't want to prematurely make it look like the project you're ready to look at. We'll make newcomers ask some dumb questions though. No, the language is not garbage collected. It's not dynamically typed. See, here's the thing, right? Um, I point at those, like that Hacker News post and that Reddit post because here are a couple folks, 
Right, and I, I know in the one case, the Reddit post, it's one guy, right? It's Ginger Bill. In the Hacker News scenario, I don't know how many people are working on that. Let's just assume it's one. And, and now here's the thing. Ginger Bill stepped in it, in my opinion, right? He wasn't ready, and he released early. That was his call. Um, now, I'm not saying the, the response he got is what he should have gotten, but it's a lesson, right? <clears throat> and the Hacker News thing, I don't know that the guy, whoever's responsible for that language, I don't know that they submitted that. Somebody else probably found it and submitted it. But boy, oh boy, did they get their ass handed to them. And, you know, look, I just, I look at it this way. I get it. If I wrote lots of documentation, some people wouldn't ask dumb questions. But here's the other thing that I've explained before. Even with documentation, people are going to ask dumb questions. It's just going to happen. So I've resigned myself to it. Um, it is what it is. Uh, I could literally have 655 pages of complex, full documentation on this compiler, and somebody would still ask me, why, do, why am I doing this? You know, right? Because then it's 655 pages of documentation and no one's going to want to read it, right? And so that's the, it's like people want the perfect snapshot of here's one page of not too dense text that tells you exactly what you need to know, but not really, right? And, uh, you know, so my, my attitude is until I reach the point where I think it's ready um, and I'm willing to, I make the decision myself to say, okay, if I put this out there and it ends up on Hacker News, I'm okay with whatever they do because in my opinion, it's complete and I can, you know, I can ex answer and point to the documentation I have and the examples I have and everything, right? Um, it, it, to me, it's just products 101. Um, even though this is open source and I'm not charging any money for it, you still, I still want to treat this like I would treat any kind of product release. Um, you know, occasionally, if people find it on GitHub or people come to the stream, you know, this is different, right? Because people can interact with me directly. Um, if they find it on GitHub, they were probably searching for stuff anyway. Um, but when you put it out there in the public, you had better be ready. And, you know, another case in point is look at what happened with the whole Redis, you know, licensing brouhaha the other day. And, you know, I'm not gonna get into like, if the Apache Foundation is evil or any of that nonsense, you know, Salvatore basically said it was a miscommunication, it was poorly communicated. So here's a project that people generally respect and like, and because one issue was not communicated well, you know, it stirred up a you know a shitstorm. So to me, the takeaway is just communicate well, put the time into it, and there's no rush, right? It's like OBS. OBS is open source. It's ready when it's ready, right? Don't ship something that's broken. It just doesn't make sense. Wait, right? You know, you don't have a pointy hair manager hovering over you telling you that, you know, they're going to lose their job and the board members are going to personally spank them if they don't get that release out tonight. So if you don't have that external issue, then why impose it, you know, on yourself? So that's why there's no documentation because, yeah, it's a support thing ultimately is what it comes down to. And I also, <clears throat> there's another side of it too. 
I mean, I would say I'm a third into this for the bootstrap compiler. Well, between the third and the, you know, the whole, so the other two thirds I have to go, a lot could change. And if I start pumping out text and I start pumping out documentation and I start pumping out examples, then people will see that, then they will be upset because, you know, you have the people that won't like it because it's not ready yet. Then you'll have the people that will be upset because it will change and that won't match their original expectation. Um, so again, it's just, it sounds horrible, but you know, it all comes down to managing people's expectations and just knowing how the hive mind, you know, works in these cases. And with all that said, I want to reiterate, I am fully aware that I could dot all my I's, cross all my T's, dot all the J's, and even have little emojis and happy dancing animations and wondrous demos and everything, and they will all still shit over it. So I realize that, but I would rather that happen. Oh, yes, that's right. Sorry. Oh, and the seven. And across the seven, too. Um, although if we put the cross in the zero, then someone will pedantically say that that's not a zero, that's an empty set. So, and we got that wrong, right? Um, <coughs> so anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> uh. I've had mathematicians tell me that putting a cross through a zero is an old um, symbolism for an empty set. I've had many mathematicians tell me I should not do that. <laughs> I leave my sevens uncrossed. Yep. <clears throat> so, yeah. It's fun doing stuff out in the open. Not. <laughs> that is very true. That's very true. <clears throat> it's really funny when uh, my youngest brother, he, he worked in uh, a academia for quite some time, and he used to tell me that, you know, Physi uh, physics envy was very strong amongst the mathematicians and the computer science people had mathematician envy <clears throat> and um, I always thought that was really funny. So what I wanted to kind of ponder, I guess, today was what do I need to do for inline assembly? Because as I get into some of these next issues where I'm emitting um, initializers and finalizers and some of this other stuff, it might be convenient to be able to intersperse some inline assembly temporarily. Um, so, I, uh, I should fix that. I actually know. So, I already have the encoding, all that stuff works. We can obviously, I can decode it into, um, so this is assembly language for the bytecode. This is not native. Mm. 
Native is all a post-processing thing. The only thing I expose in base code is, is the base code platform because then it's easier to make that portable. Um, so when I talk about assembly, it's gonna look like this. It's not gonna look like ARM or Intel. So, um, my thought was I would have a directive, a compiler directive, pound assembly, you'd have a block. Inside the block would be assembly code. But this raises lots of interesting uh, things because Hey, flathead screwdriver. Hey, Slayer Darth. How are we going to parse that? Uh... It's a bootstrapping thing, really, more than anything, right? I, I have so little infrastructure built in the compiler right now. Um, that's primarily the reason for it. Um, plus, once, once I start getting into rewriting the compiler in base code, there's going to be some stuff that I'm gonna want at a fairly low level. Um, and so being able to wrap something up into inline bytecode assembly would be convenient at that point. Um, so that's primarily why. And yes, I mean, technically speaking, again, the compiler right now is, you know, on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is awesome in terms of its optimizing capabilities, it's a 1.5. So, you know, for a while, I probably will be able to write better bytecode assembly, more efficient bytecode assembly for some cases than the compiler can generate. Eventually, the compiler will improve. Maybe it'll get to a five or a six on average. <clears throat> So the, the, the challenge with this is, and I love a challenge, yes sir. books no idea I could ask my brother um, yeah So what's going to happen here is the parser is going to parse the directive. The directive is going to say, okay, I expect an expression next to it. And then it's going to try to parse the block just like a normal block. but that's going to fail.
So it's interesting. This almost is like a very prototypical case of how I would want to handle macros or, or something of that ilk once we get into metaprogramming. So then, okay, do we have a special block that's like two open brackets? So this is a literal block. And so then the parser just pulls in whatever is literally inside of it. And that and that's a special kind of node. <clears throat> and then we would have another parser that consumes what's inside of it. So we'd give that to the assembler and we'd say, here's the string, right? So if we move two bytes, one into I0 and one into I1, and then we sub to I2, I0, I1, right? So that's one possibility. Another possibility would be to do it like some of the C compilers do today. And you'd have to put it in a string or I really don't like that. Because <clears throat> really, just building a small parser for the assembly language itself shouldn't be too hard. Because we have to support a label, we have to support our directives, right? So we have a line, we have section, we have the data definitions, about it and then as far as the mnemonics are concerned it's always going to be three and one two up to four right so you could just get split on space and split on comma right because that's that's the syntax and And all directives start with a dot. So that one is fairly easy. So yeah, this is kind of interesting. <clears throat> the, 
Delexer would almost have to treat this as a kind of comment. Because otherwise, I don't know how else. Because if I just Lex this token, these are separate. And then, then you know, the Lexer is not going to recognize any of this unless I add it. But <clears throat> then that starts to get crazy. Um, so in a way, like this would be, it's a block, but it's a, it would all be parsed as one unit. <clears throat> and just like comments, what would, so I guess this is like a here string or something similar to that. been very unhappy with the way most hear strings work. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think the double brace, at least as a first shot, would work.
we match the opening bracket. <clears throat> accumulate just like a block comment So we first try to match the raw block because it's the most specific. <clears throat> if that fails, then we fall back to our normal lexers for the opening closing brace. So now with that, what should happen is I should get an error from the parser that it doesn't have a prefix parser available for the raw block. Yes, perfect. So, all right, now let's go to the parser. And, uh, we'll just, this part's pretty mindless.
So now the raw block is wired up into the parser. So now it should recognize it, put it in the AST. We don't have, so now the compiler is um, complaining. Because we don't have a handler for that AST node type. To the compiler for that.
paper piecing bowl. take a really short break. I'll be right back.
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. I had to get a new coffee maker. And this one has just a little black and white display. But it's funny because when it ran out of water, it says, more water, please. I thought it'd be fun to hack that image, have like a monster eating a kitten or something. <laughs> uh, this is why I never get anything done. Um, hey, Can Can. How's it going? Yes, I did host you uh, the other day, I think. Maybe it was yesterday. <clears throat> Forget, uh, you were working on a C++? Yeah, you were working on a C++ game engine. the element so we need to add that to element builder So that's pretty much it there. And then directive. <clears throat>
So right now, I'm, so I'm actually working on a compiler for a uh, programming language I'm designing called Base Code. Within that, I want to support inline assembly. So I'm extending the Base Code compiler to allow me to have uh, raw blocks. So my, my example file is this. So this is an example of a raw block expression. So the, the compiler, the parser slash compiler doesn't interpret anything in between the double braces. Um, that just comes in as a raw stream of bytes. And then the directive will take that, the assembly directive will take that and pass that off to the assembler. And then the assembler will parse what's inside that and turn it into instructions and directives. And then I'm fixing the directive so that it, if it can't find a handler <coughs> for a given directive, we get an error. So what should happen now, <laughs> notice I said should, <coughs> we should get an error that the assembly directive is not supported or unknown. And then we'll add <coughs> handlers for those. <laughs> oh, I finally got my <clears throat> AC adapter for my camera. So, plugged into the wall. No more battery. Yay! Unknown directive assembly. Catching. All right. So let me get back here. And This is a Canon Rebel T6i. directive is just going to return true, but we shouldn't get that error anymore. Directive. 
and let's put a breakpoint there. The expression inside the directive should be our raw block. We look at the value, make sure that's coming through okay. Yep, there it is. Perfect. And there's our raw text. So then here, As far as the as far as the directive is concerned, that's pretty much all it's going to do, right? We're going to cast the expression to a um, raw block. The assembler is expecting a reference to a result, which we have in the session, and a stream that it's going to parse from. And we take that whatever is in the raw block, put it in the stream, pass it through, and then assemble from source is currently going to fail, which actually that's not too bad. Are there any tools you'd recommend for developers looking to do some low-level stuff, such as you do on OS X? Um, I mean, really, I guess it all depends on what you want to do, right? It is kind of what it comes down to. If, and also, like when you say low level, are you wanting to write assembly language? Um, you know, what exactly is it you're wanting to do? And if you just want to write C or C++, you have a lot of options. I mean, you can do everything from a shell, you could use Vim or Emacs, you could use CLion, you could use Xcode, um, you can use Visual Studio Code. So there's lots of options there. On the assembly language front, um, again, it kind of just depends on what you want to do. Um, I've used uh, FASM in the past. I've used um, GCC. You're probably better off just using GCC as an assembler. Um, And then from there, obviously you could use make files, you could use CMake. I, for assembly stuff, I would probably just use plain Jane make files. Um, and then, and then at that point, now you're starting into how do you program against OS 10 at the assembly level, and that's a large and complex topic.
See, I know that I'm roughly doing things right when I can add things like this, and it's not, it's not too bad. It's not too much effort. Um, except... Should be getting an error message. I gotta fix that. That's why it's not showing. Okay, so we're going all the way down through um, the assembler, and the assembler, <laughs> there is no implementation yet for assemble from source. So that'll be the next thing to do. So let me, let's review that. So I created an, an assignments base code source file as example as I was talking through, and this actually flushed out a couple bugs that I need to fix. So I'll keep that around as a test case. Um, on the AST side, I added a raw block to the node types and to the name map table. Then I added a raw block node <clears throat> builder function, the AST evaluator, I added raw block. So the AST evaluator is the thing the compiler calls to convert the AST into the compiler model. On the uh, CPP module side, we include the raw block header. We add the raw block uh, node type to our 
um, evaluator map. And this is the function we call locally uh, on the evaluator, if that is the node that comes through. Oops, I mean, hit that key. And then the raw block evaluator function is pretty simple. We call the make raw block on the builder, passing in the current scope and the string, right, that's inside the raw block. Because the compiler doesn't really have anything to say at this point about what's in there. It's, it's up to other things to interpret it. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna fix this. <clears throat> so we added a raw block as a file. The code DOM formatter pull in raw block, and then I just added an initial case here for it. Um, I need to change the color and that's not super important. On directive, <clears throat> so I added, uh, directives have two evaluation phases. One is during the model generation phase. <clears throat> this is the evaluate. And then after everything has been done, like all the meta programs have run, everything's, <clears throat> we're, we're ready to actually do the code generation. Just before that, we, we call execute. So this is something that happens um, after model manipulation, before code generation. This happens during model generation. Um, and then in the CPP file, we pull in raw block and we added assembly as a valid directive. And then I added uh, error handling here, which I didn't have before. So if we can't find an execute evaluator for it, we get an error. If we can't find an evaluate, we, we get an error. And then the directive implementation, there is no evaluate right now for the assembly directive. Um, if we start putting attributes or other things on there, then we probably would have some code in here. Um, but right now, for execute, we just we know the expression is going to be a raw block. I guess one thing we could do here is we could assert that this is a raw block, right? So if you did assembly and then two, that'd be an error because we expect there to be a raw block. Um, so let me. So we can do that there. Um, but we cast the raw block. The assembler is expecting a stream um, to parse. So we give it a create a stream and we put the string that's in the raw block in the stream and we pass that along. And for the directive, that's it. And then on the element builder, I added a make raw block in the implementation. We pull in the header file. And it's a pretty simple function, right? We do up a raw block and we put it in the list and we're in the map and we return the pointer. Um, element types, I forward declare raw block. I added raw block to the element type enum, added it to the name map. Um, inline assembly, this is my test case file uh, for Step one was getting, changing the compiler so that this is even possible, which we just did. And then step two will be implementing the state machine parser inside of the assembler to be able to understand the syntax and turn it into, you know, basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna call, you know, methods on instruction block, right? Um, that do these things. So I think I can actually get a fairly functional source assembler going today. It shouldn't be too difficult. Um,
One of the nice things about assemblers is that they're syntactically, they're, the language is very simple. And if we're not doing things like macros and really complex stuff, it's even easier. So on the Lexer, I added a raw block Lexer and added that to the map. Um, so this works very much, it's just a cut and paste with some changes of a block comment. So this handles nested raw blocks, they just coalesce essentially, and we just build up whatever is in the source stream, um, and that's what becomes the token inside of the raw block. The parser, so we added raw block prefix parser. And, oh, and we also, I put, I have to add that to the map. So for the prefix parsers, if we get a raw block token, then that's the parser that we want to invoke. Um, added a, uh, well, you know what, I skipped over this. Um, all the raw block parser does is create the AST node and pass in the token and, um, return itself and you know what okay good all right I thought it might not be set in the location but it is so a raw block element is very simple it just has a pointer to its module, a pointer to its parent scope, and then the string value that was inside of the raw block. Um, session. Uh, I added errors, or added an error here, right? So if the directive doesn't execute correctly, then we should be telling the user about that. Um, in the short example, I did some other uh, testing with type aliases. There are some bugs here that need to be fixed. In token, I added raw block, added it to the map, and added the constant version of that token. And that is, that, like I say, that gets me up to the assembler part. So I think what I'm gonna do in The assembler is I'm just gonna write a really simple state machine parser for, you know, just a line parser essentially, right? Because that's all assembly language is. Um, and for the level of assembly that we have right now in base code, that'll work perfectly, right? So it'll just end up have a function that decomposes the line into something, right? A directive, an instruction, whatever, and labels. And then we'll just have a switch that calls the, the correct thing on the instruction block. Um, yeah. And the cool thing is we already have mechanisms for like variable fix up and all that, right? Because I can, yeah, I can do the exact same thing we're doing in other parts of the compiler. So if you, if you like say move a value from a, a label or something or a variable that's outside of the scope of the assembly directive, that'll just become a deferred um, label that needs to be resolved. Okay, so um, let's take let's take this out there.
And then for error reporting of the assembly language itself, what will end up happening is I'll populate errors into the result and and because like the parser we only have a location that spans the whole thing so it'll end up happening if there's something wrong with the assembly itself it'll just highlight the block and then the error will be underneath it because um, again the parser is not once we hit this part right we don't know anything that's inside that um, so I might later have to come back and make another pass to make, to improve that if I want to. So yeah, on and off today, I'm gonna work on the actual parser inside the assembler. Like I say, I think it should be fairly straightforward. Um, All right. So I got about 15 minutes here before I gotta go. Anybody have any questions? Any interesting topics in the news? Hey, Kippy Bo. So far, I, I like using the GitHub project thing here. My only complaint is I, I would like some kind of hierarchical relationship here. But, oh, these are Razor, mm, and they're Razor something. <laughs> Um, I don't remember exactly which model. The primary reason I like these is that they're old fashioned, wired, had a mic in it too, which was handy. Um, the wire, wireless headphones were okay, uh, but yeah, when I was doing five and a half hour streams, they would die and that was kind of annoying. Battery tech sucks. We need, a, we need a lot better battery tech. Any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, with with Vim, with any tool, I guess, you just have to you have to accept the pain, right? I mean, I think that's what makes it so difficult. Is people, if you've never, if you're very absolute beginner, right? Then the learning curve just seems very steep. Period. Um, if you've used some other kind of editor and you're switching then you have this, you know, cognitive dissonance because you're switching to something else. And so, you know, especially if you're changing IDs or editors, I would just say that you have to, if you really truly want to switch, you really truly want to use that new tool, you have to accept, you have to slow down, right? You have to accept you're going to be very, very inefficient non-productive in that new tool, new tool for a while. Um, and that's going to vary, right? It, it, it's going to depend on a lot of things. Um, but you, you know, the speed comes back over time. Um, I have used VI for well over 30 years in Vim, you know, I don't know, I think I switched to Vim sometime in the early 2000s. Um, I don't remember exactly. I know prior to like 2004, I was still using VI um, for pretty much everything. Uh, and then this year, I switched to NeoVim, which there are things about NeoVim I like. There are things I'm not caring for too much. It's still very, very raw, I would say. Lots of weird performance issues, compatibility issues. Um, but yeah. And honestly, I can't remember how long it took me. You know, in my in my memory, I, it doesn't seem like it took that long to become comfortable with VI. But you also have to keep in mind that, like, I was using text editors that compared to today's environments, right? They were more command driven, more stateful, you know, more modal like them anyway. Um, you know, like on the mainframe, if you've ever used ISPF and XEdit, you'll know what I mean, right? Like, so I was already working in environments that had editors that were all command based. They're all modal in some way. Um, so going to Vim for me, or VI rather, was not, it just fit in what I was already doing. Um, and a lot of the editors I was using on OS 10, or not OS 10, OS 2, <laughs> OS 2, um, were again, <clears throat> they were duplicates of things you would find in the mainframe. So they were very similar, you know, a lot, all those editors were very similar in my, at least the ones I picked or the ones I was exposed to back in the 80s. So, yeah. Um, but it's like anything. I would say this. If you force yourself to use VI, Vim, every day for 30 days, at the end of 30 days, are you going to be a Vim god? No. 
Are you going to be using like every possible shortcut and generating macros on the fly as you type and then reusing them instantly without thinking about it? No. Are you going to have completely mastered, you know, your VimRC and all the plugins that you want and how they should be configured? No. Will you be able to edit a text file? Yeah. Will you be, you know, will you be able to basically move around um, in a text file and get something done with it? Sure, you know. So if you set your, your expectations right, then, you know, you won't be too disappointed. You'll make progress. Within a year, you'll basically, I would say, have a firm understanding of, you know, them. And now the one thing I would throw out there about Vim and about Emacs, although I don't use Emacs, so I'm going to speak about it as a, just a, as a secondhand observer of people using it. What you will typically hear on the tubes is you should use Vim or you should use Emacs because, you know, it's just going to make you so much faster. And they're like awesome, incredible editors. And, you know, like if you're a Vim god, you can type four keys and edit a 10,000 line file. I, I want to caution <laughs> that that sort of approach to those tools, while theoretically true, is often going to lead to massive disappointment. Um, in my experience, with the exception of perhaps, you know, James himself, nobody has all that shit memorized. Nobody, right? Uh, you know, everybody has their handful of editing motion commands that they use and, you know, some people maybe know 20 and some use them regularly. Some people maybe can memorize 10 and use them regularly. My point is what you're going to find, contrary to all the hype, is that once you start using those editors on a daily basis, you will find that they're a text editor and that there's not much difference between them and any other text editor you would use. Um, there just isn't. And, and to get the, the other, here's the other thing. <clears throat> to get them uh, to a point where it's comfortable, where it's usable, you need a lot of plugins. You know, Vim out of the box is great if you're remoting and, you know, you're SSHing into some server and you need to edit something in the Etsy folder or whatever, and you just, you just need an editor, right? In that scenario, it doesn't really matter. You're probably not going to be doing much. You know, it's going to take you 30 seconds or whatever. But if you're going to write code or you're going to write text or whatever, you, you need plugins. And it takes a lot of time to curate plugins. And the thing that, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I don't use Vim as my primary environment. A lot of the plugins are, they're open source, they're cool, it's great. The authors enjoy maintaining them for exactly 16.5 months, and then they abandon them. And then you discover that the latest version of NeoVim or the latest version of Vim itself that plugin doesn't work anymore because they rev to the latest version of Ruby or the latest version of Python or the latest version of Lua or whatever, and it broke the plugin. Um, and too bad. The guy who created it doesn't give a shit anymore, and you know, now you gotta find a replacement. Um, that's very annoying. <laughs> uh, so you have to be prepared for that as well. Um, that a lot of basic functionality, things that in, in 2018 we, we would consider basic functionality comes from plugins, not from the tool itself. The tool itself is, it's okay for what it is, but it, it needs lots of window dressing. <clears throat> so that's my diatribe on Vim. And, uh, yeah. 
and I have a general rule. My general rule is that, you know, like I say, I generally work about five and a half, six hours a day writing code. My rule is if I, if I have to configure any tool in my tool chain more than one day per week, I abandon it. It's, it's just too much overhead, right? And with Vim, you, I have to tweak it every freaking time, right? I have to tweak it constantly. Um, and I just, I don't want to spend my time doing that. I want to spend my time actually working on the thing I'm trying to build, um, not mucking with my tools. Now, some people, they love messing with their tools. And if that's what you like to do, that's great. But, oh, here we go. Let's see. So, Inahe, in, no, in Inhae, I'm, in I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced. She's online. Brooke Zerker's online. Uh, we've got creating a 2D rendering library in Rust. That could be interesting. Yeah, let's take a look at that one. These Rust guys, they need all the help they can get, you know? size nice yes it is this is the complaint I have about open source right um, and look it's I get it you're building stuff for free and a lot of people don't a lot of people who have never had commercial product experience like building something releasing it what all that means and understanding what the user's perspective is Developers will build stuff and they'll think, oh, well, you know, this is a rat's nest and that little corner of this is busted and this little corner of that's going to cause people to need to tweak this every 24 hours. But, you know, hey, I can do it, so why can't they? And so they put it out there. And again, it's free, so, you know, beggars can't be choosers. But you have to be aware of that issue. Now, I will say this, the open source community... Um, has gotten better at understanding that a lot of users don't want to do that, but there's still a long way to go there. Okay, we're gonna rate Atomic U size. <laughs> he is, he or she, I'm not sure, are creating a 2D rendering library in REST. That should be interesting. I will be back online tomorrow at 5 a.m. and uh, pick up wherever I leave off today. And uh, yeah, we'll see how much of the assembler I can actually, the parser I can get going. That'd be kind of cool. And yeah, more to come. See you tomorrow. Bye.